have been resolved. There are currently seven people that are either registered for the lab and not the lecture or vice versa. I have emailed all of those about 40 or 50 minutes ago. Um, so all of those who are having lab scheduling issues still, uh, you got an email from me. But for the most part, I think the problem is solved because we can easily fit seven people in the remaining lab sections. Uh, office hours will start this week. I'm going to show you a, a page on the website um, that lists all that and talk a bit about that in a second. I have received the clicker hardware, which is the little doohickey that I stick in my computer and makes it all magically work. I'm expecting to install the software for that tomorrow, and then uh, I have to figure out how to have to use it. Um, so please bring your clickers on Wednesday, and I'll have more information about clicker registration and all that other uh, happy stuff um, on Wednesday as well. Um, and then what I mentioned uh, previously, um, this Thursday, please bring your lab login and ID if you have it. Uh, those who did not receive it will receive it um, before this Thursday. What may have happened is that you, an email was sent to you, but between the fact that like some of the department's emails just magically disappear and all the spam controls, uh, it may not have gotten to you, which is not a problem. We can reset your password uh, for you during lab. Any questions on this stuff? <clears throat> okay. So on our really fancy web page, uh, no, I don't really care about that. And here we go. Um, if you go to the contacts page, in addition to seeing mugshots of all the um, staff, at the very bottom we have a office hour grid. And you'll notice that we are providing somewhere along the lines of 40 to 50 office hours per week. That's a lot. Um, and most of them are going to be in the Thornton stacks. The directions to the Thornton stacks are at the very bottom of the page. Um, it's essentially uh, the top, the, the second floor of Thornton Hall. <coughs> The main engineering office um, is A122A. It's, it's directly above that. Most of the TA office hours are going to be held there. The only ones that are not are my office hours, which are here, uh, Professor Coe's office hours, which are there, and uh, the Sunday night lab session. So the Sunday night lab session is in uh, the Olsen lab room because it's the makeup lab for those who miss labs. Um, and, of course, my office hours and Professor Coe's office hours are in our respective offices. All of the others, oh, and those are colored beige uh, to indicate that. All of the other office hours are um, in the Thornton stacks. When you go there, um, in order to find the TA, because there might be a lot of people there, <coughs> first you can look and find his or her picture up here. They also will generally be having a CS101 TA sign that uh, we're going to put on top of the computer. Um, <coughs> You'll notice on Thursday night we have it stacked with more than one TA at a time. Um, no matter how many times I warn people about it, everybody waits until Thursday to do uh, their assignments. Note that um, I have instructed the TAs and will continue to do so that as much as they would like to stay there forever and ever and help, um, they all have lives of their own and need to get home at some fixed time. So. The, while we do have a lot of office hours on Thursday, please don't save all of your um, programming effort until then. Obviously, a TA who's very busy is not going to be able to spend quite as much time with you as uh, TAs who are not as busy. So in general, we have found that earlier in the week and earlier in the day um, are better office hours to go to solely because it's more one-on-one. -on -one. And students who have gone to those have found them to be extremely helpful. So everybody explains things differently. Uh, I would encourage you to try going to a couple different TAs, um, seeing which ones you like explanations of the best, and you know, feel free to show up every week to a given TA's office hours. That happens every semester, and that's totally fine. Um, the other thing I want to note is that from time to time, a TA won't be able to make his or her office hours <laughs> because they have you know, tests, exams, sickness, trips, whatnot. All of that is going to be noted right above this particular table. So if you're about to head out in the blizzard that we've received today, um, just check that uh, to make sure that the TA is actually going to be in those office hours. In particular, um, one of the TAs is Thursday. I, I have to answer that, uh, but can't make his office hours. Questions, comments, concerns? Okay. So. So last 
them, he talked a bit about algorithms. He talked about good algorithms. He talked about some not so good algorithms. Some algorithms that were just plain bad. Uh, <clears throat> What we are going to do, of course, in this class is figure out a way to translate those algorithms into the Java programming language. Java programming language is uh, going to take a good amount of time to feel comfortable with. Um, the first programs we introduce, not surprisingly, are going to be fairly simple programs. And we're going to get to more complicated ones as the semester progresses. So our first Java program, all it's going to do is say, hello world. And this is going to be pretty similar to the um, program that you did in lab last Thursday, the one that displayed your name or the set that you solved your compile error. This is the program, a whopping five lines of it. Um, one of the, the issues with Java is that there's a lot of complexity to the language. And it's impossible to really hide all that complexity at this point in the course. So there's a lot of things that I'm going to show you, and I'm going to tell you that we will get to them later in the semester, but I'm not going to actually explain what they mean now. And this drives students crazy every semester. Um, I, at the end of the semester, and I do this every semester, at the end of the semester, I'll ask you if you felt there was a different way to go about doing this. I certainly have not seen one other than, um, so let me start that sentence over again. Basically, when we see a difficult concept or something that's going to be explained later in the semester, I, I can't really go and just start explaining all of them all at once because it's going to be too much. So there's a lot of things here that I'm just going to say, memorize, and you'll learn what they mean later. I promise you that everything that you see in this program, you will at some point in this semester understand. Hopefully, uh, at some point, I will definitely explain it to you. So this particular line here, public static void main string bracket bracket args. Uh, there's actually a lot of complexity in that line. Memorize that line. Every program we write will have, at least until the very end of the semester, will have that line in it. <clears throat> Essentially, that's telling Java, where do I start executing the program? And this one is probably, perhaps pretty obvious where to start executing it. But essentially, Java is going to look at this program that you have here, and it's going to go to the beginning of public static void main string bracket bracket args, and it's going to start executing the program there. In particular, the program is this one line. The program starts at this curly bracket and ends at that curly bracket. <clears throat> That's how Java knows where the program starts, public static void main string bracket bracket args, and that corresponding curly bracket. <coughs> it knows that, the, knows that the program ends at the curly bracket that correspondingly closes it. You'll also notice that it, it's in public class Hello World. Every Java program that we write, or that can be written, must be in a class. What a class is, we'll see, I promise. Um, every class must be public. What public is, we'll see, I promise. Um, in particular, the name, ooh, wait, I can change color. OK. The name of the class must be the exact same as the name of the file that is kept in. So this must be kept in a file called hello world.java. I got horrendous grades in my handwriting, uh, as you can tell. <clears throat> so you'll note that the class is public class Hello World with H and W capitalized. So is the file name. <coughs> and of course, public class Hello World has an open curly bracket, which has a closed curly bracket there. <coughs> the programs that you are going to be writing probably for the first month are, wait, let me change color again. The programs that you will be writing for the first month will essentially just have that part replaced. You are going to obviously write longer and longer programs where everything is inside the main method or public static or main string bracket bracket R. <clears throat> there are going to be a couple things outside, in particular comments. We're going to talk about comments in a couple slides. And of course, your class name is going to vary. It was compile error in the lab. It was my name was the other class in the lab. Uh, but essentially, the ones that you saw in the lab, the ones that we'll see for the next month or two, will all have stuff within the main method. <coughs> OK, questions so far? Right, right, right. Yeah, so that's all the stuff that I just talked about. And if you run it, this is what it looks like. <coughs> I'm not going to, I mean, I can demo it for you. Actually, I probably won't demo it because you all went through the lab. Um, but essentially, it prints out Hello World, which is pretty much what we told it to print out. 
You'll also notice it says press any key to continue. That's just so the window doesn't disappear. And when you went through the lab, that's exactly what it did when it said, hello world, my name is Christo, whatever you filled in your name was, um, and I saw my compiler. Same basic thing. So programs have lots of parts, and we're, I'm going to talk about some of them now, and then uh, to finish up this slide set, we're going to rapidly move into the next slide set, which talks about them in greater detail. Um, well, that animation worked well. So we have a whole slew of things that make up a program. Some of them are called keywords. A keyword is a word that is, as we're going to see, we can actually make uh, name things by names. We can name something Foo, we can name something Far, we can name something Fred. Certain words are reserved. And if we go back to the program, some of these words are already reserved by Java. In particular, public has a meaning. Class has a meaning. Static, void, they all have very specific meanings in Java. So you can't use those words. Um, operators, we're going to see a lot of mathematical operators. Uh, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and some other ones that are, are more uh, complicated. Punctuation, <clears throat> uh, program to define identifiers, and strict syntactic rules. The strict syntactic rules mean that every statement must end with a semicolon, for example. And this was one of the things that you saw in the compiler part of your lab, is that because the line did not end with a semicolon, Java barfed, it didn't like it, it said, I'm sorry, I'm not going to compile this. And except for those who didn't have Java installed in their computers in the first two labs, everybody saw that at one point or the other. <clears throat> we have a lot of Java documentation. The nice thing about Java is it comes with these huge libraries. So if you want to do something such as compute the cosine of an angle, you don't have to write the cosine method. It's already there for you. It's in the Java library. And we're going to talk about that library as the course goes on. <clears throat> There's a lot of documentation for that. You might want to familiarize with it, uh, for, blah, blah, blah. familiarize yourself with it at some point. Not necessarily yet. I'm going to be talking about the, doc the documentation in the next uh, couple lectures. Uh, in particular, we have a link to it on our website. So there are a bunch of keywords that I mentioned in Java. Public, static, void, string. String is sort of a keyword. I'm going to kind of ignore the fact that it's not completely a keyword. But these are things that have a very specific meaning to Java. They are telling Java something to do. If I just say, if I just make up some nonsense word, that doesn't mean anything to Java, but public means something very specific. Java cares a lot about case. Everything essentially must be, all the keywords are all lowercase. So public with a capital P is different than public with a little p. Right, right, right. I, I want to actually focus on the last bullet on this slide. Right, the first one says we have keywords. The second one says uh, semicolons and statements. We know that because that's what we have to stick into the compiler. Part of the of learning job is to learn where to properly use punctuation. This is really important because th there are many things involved in programming. One is learning how to translate an algorithm into whatever programming language, and one is remembering to have your brackets or your curly braces or your periods or whatnot in the right place. And this is something that um, you guys will be going through as the course progresses. <clears throat> so <clears throat> we will generally talk about statements in code. And a statement is telling Java to do one thing. System.out.println hello world is telling Java in some kind of strange way to print out a line to the screen. And a statement is actually different than a line. You'll notice here that this one statement is on two lines. Right? The statement starts at the S and it ends at the semicolon. In general, statements are always ended by semicolons. That's how Java knows where, to, um, where the statement ends. This could be on, tw on 10 different lines. Java wouldn't care. All it cares is that um, it starts at some point and it ends at the semicolon. And then Java's happened. Okay. <clears throat> so next up is commenting. And we've seen some comments in the programs we've played with so far. 
This, for example, might be a well-competent program other than the fact that one of those comments is kind of confusing. Commenting is something that everybody hates doing. We are going to make you do it. And there's actually reasons for it. If you are writing big programs, and some of you may not take another computer science class, and that's fine, but we're still going to train you as if you were going to go on in computer science. So if you're writing a big program, and you're coming back to a part that you haven't played with in a year, it becomes very difficult to figure out what's going on in your own code. The, the grading system is, I think, 21,000 lines of code that I wrote. And when I go back to it, if there weren't any comments, I'd have no idea what's going on, because some of that stuff I wrote many years ago. If you are looking at somebody else's code, um, meaning that you're working in a place where you're allowed to look at other people's code, and there are no comments, then it also becomes somewhat confusing what's going on. So for that reason, we like to add in comments. The comment is English explanation of what's going on. Java doesn't care at all about a comment. When Java sees two slashes, it's going to ignore everything until the end of the line. So that line, that line, and that line is completely ignored. I could also add a comment here if I wanted to. Because it will read in this public class display forecast, and then it gets to the two slashes and everything until the end of the line is returned. We're going to talk a bit about what constitutes good commenting here, and some of it's going to be um, explained later on. In particular, every file you submit must have your name, your user ID, and your lab section. So your user ID is ASB, well, yours isn't, but mine is ASB2T. Um, obviously your name, nicknames are fine, um, and whatever lab section you're in. Please don't ever give me social security numbers. Um, I don't want to know them. Um, there was a, a nice story in the, well, not a nice story, it was kind of a depressing story in the Cavalier Daily the other day that um, an economics class mailed 60 student social security numbers out to the entire class. Oops. Um, <coughs> turns out there's actually federal laws against using social security numbers that I think five years ago all colleges were required to stop using social security numbers as ID numbers. Yeah. <laughs> Be that as it may. <coughs> so this program is similar to the other ones we see in that it just does a couple of prints in the main method. And this says, I think there's a world market for maybe five computers. Well, this is a quote that Thomas Watson was the head of IBM in the, in the 1940s. And he actually didn't make this statement, but everybody says he did. Because it's a kind of funny statement. This is IBM who made their, their fortune on, on selling computers. And here is somebody in the 1940s saying, eh, maybe the world needs five computers. And there are individuals who have five computers now, much less the entire world. <laughs> So I would say that this is a generally well-commented program. Every couple lines of code, there's a comment showing what's going on. These programs are a bit simple. As we get to more complicated programs, I'll explain a bit more about what's good commenting. This is probably not so good commenting. You'll notice that here we have an essay from Wikipedia giving the entire history of Thomas J. Watson, born February 17, 1874. If you need to put in this much code, this much comment, something is wrong um, with the, the design. And there actually are two um, slashes on this side if this didn't show up. So this is probably not so good commenting. This is a, so you know how computers can do many things at once? In reality, uh, I'm generalizing here, but computers can only do one thing at a time. What they do is they rapidly switch from one to the other, like a thousand times per second. So this way, when you're, I don't know, reading the, the, your email and there's IM going on and you're playing a game, well, the computer's just rapidly switching between them. And this is from a, a non-Windows operating system, and it basically is a code that allows you to switch between them. And it goes blah, 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 blah. It has some magical code they don't really care about. The interesting thing is it says you're not expected to understand this. If you ever need to put this in your program, then that's probably a, not a very good comment. Basically, the person um, didn't give a very good explanation here, which is, of course, the whole purpose of comments, and then said you're not expected to understand it because he, she didn't feel like adding any more comments to it. <coughs> okay. This is an 
email that was sent to me, and it was originally entitled, Why Women Live Longer Than Men. Um, I have uh, retitled it to Human Stupidity. <coughs> I think that's my favorite number. <laughs> so in a pool on a metal ladder, blindly drilling into a ceiling with lights. Funny, feel free to send them along. The, the only caveat, of course, is that you know it has to be can't be offensive, can't be religious, can't be etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but if you do have things that you think are funny, uh, feel free to send them along. I obviously love a good laugh. <coughs> okay, <coughs> we've seen a very simple Java program. <coughs> we've seen uh, we talked a bit about algorithms. Now we're going to talk a bit about how to write more complicated Java programs. So this is the, the program that we saw before called displayforecast.java. In particular, it looks the same as, as all of the others. You'll notice that pen color, what color should I use? Yellow. Red. Someone said yellow first. Display forecast in that nice straight underline. So the displayforecast.java, the names have to be the same with the dot .java on the file name. Right. These statements are what prints out the, the stuff to the screen. It prints that out on two or three lines. I think there's a forecast for maybe five computers, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is all the stuff I talked about on the last slide. Right, right, right. right. Got it, got it, got it. Ready, ready. Come on. <laughs> so as I mentioned, Java doesn't care about white space. I didn't use the term white space before, but white space is essentially a space, a tab, or a return. <laughs> With a couple exceptions that we're going to talk about, Java doesn't care how you actually space out your program. <clears throat> if you want to print out system.out.println something, you can have it on five lines, on one line, what have you. This particular program is the exact same. And in fact, it was just one line, but this wraps it after a certain amount. And this will do the exact same thing. And you'll notice that if you're looking at it, it's kind of hard to figure out what is going on. Because it's hard to find the main method. Well, the main method starts there. And then figure out exactly how many statements there are. We like white spacing. <coughs> white spacing makes things easier to understand in terms of what's actually going on. As far as Java is concerned, it's the same. Java couldn't care less about the white space. But humans do. So this is bad white spacing. So it turns out that if you don't like white spacing, you have a future in that there is a contest called the IOCCC, or the IOCCC, which stands for the International Obfuscated C Code Contest. And C is, is sort of the, the grandparent of Java. Um, it's known for a lot of really nifty features, like being a real pain in the butt to program in. And it has a very sort of terse syntax, which means you can do a lot of really strange things with your C program that are valid programs as far as the computer is concerned, but look like gibberish to human eyes. So <coughs> they decided to make a, pro a contest out of this. And the idea was to obfuscate your C code. This, for example, is a basic interpreter. So you run this program, and it will be allow you to program, uh, it will allow you to do basic programming. This computes the area of a circle. 
So briefly, what this is saying is that uh, what color am I using? this is saying that I'm going to replace all of the underscores by this. So in here, all of these underscores are replaced by that, and then it sort of goes through and compiles it. But that computes, I'm sorry, it computes pi, not the area of a circle. That's a pig Latin translator. <laughs> Guess what that is? Tic-tac-toe. Got it. Tic-tac-toe game. <laughs> so how this works, I mean, the, the thing is that someone wrote a program, and then they changed all their white space to make it look like tic-tac-toe. So somehow, this, I mean, this is a thing that, that C allows you to do this, to, to make your programs look really bizarre like this. Um, Java does it, thankfully. OK. So we know we like good white space. Next up is identifiers. Identifier is a way to name something in a computer program. We're going to be referring to lots of things. We have data, we have programs, we have lots of things going on when we're running a computer program, and we want to call them by name. <coughs> so we're going to create identifiers. An identifier is some name that we give some part of a program so that we can refer to it later. Identifiers can really be anything we want. Foo, bar, Fred, um, blue, doesn't matter. There are some, <clears throat> as far as Java is concerned, it doesn't matter. But as far as we are concerned for this class, there's some rules that we kind of want you to follow. And in particular, identifiers should be somewhat relevant. If you are figuring out the radius of a circle, you should probably call it radius, or maybe R, not red. <clears throat> Uh, with height, length, if we're dealing with, for example, a rectangle. Some identifiers are a bit on the long side. Long radius of the circle. Long width of the box that is being used, et cetera, et cetera. You could use those. Java couldn't care less. But realize that you're going to have to type that in every time you want to use that variable. If you like, forget to capitalize the T, then Java's not going to be very happy. Things that are too short are also kind of bad, because if you just name your variable starting at A and go through the alphabet, you have no idea what Q refers to. If you are doing Cartesian coordinates, sure, you might want to have an X, Y, Z, because you have your 3D position. If you're doing circles, you might want to have R for radius. But in general, one letter um, character names are, or one letter names are probably not very good. <coughs> this is important. Good identifier names. In addition to, we'll, we might very well take points off if your identifier names are pretty bad. But they will help the graders understand what's going on in your program. And of course, they're the ones that are doing the grading, hence why they're called graders. It's really intelligent. So some words are reserved. As I mentioned before, it can't be used as identifiers. Particularly the yellow ones can never be used as identifiers. Public, class, static, void. Some other words are sort of reserved. We're going to talk about the difference uh, later in the semester. But we still shouldn't be using them as, as, as identifiers. <coughs> Main, string, system, out, print, or print lines, that sort of stuff. OK. As I mentioned before, case matters. Public is not equal to public with a capital P. It's not equal to public in all caps. Java pays attention to the case so that when you enter public with a capital P, it's going to be very different than public that is all capitalized. The only thing that is reserved there is public with a lowercase p, or public that's all lowercase. Sure, you could use the rest of them. It's generally not recommended. OK. We're going to see what we can use identifiers for in a bit. So a statement in Java is generally one line. And certainly the statements we're going to see for the first homework are all one line. System.out.println, hello world. That tells Java to print hello world out to the, uh, to the screen. In particular, it takes everything in between the quotes, but not the quotes themselves, and displays that on the screen. Right, all statements must end in a semicolon, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. This is a computer sold by um, Tandy Corporation in 1989. So all PCs, high-end PCs, have always been right around $2,000. 
You'll notice they're still around $2,000 today. They were around $2,000 in 1980 because that's sort of the limit of what people are willing to pay. So the companies make computers aimed towards that rate. Obviously, you can get computers for much cheaper. I sort of talk about high-end computers. So this is a Tandy computer, and what I want you to do is guess the price. The hint I will give is that Tandy was the parent of Radio Shack. How much do you think the computer cost? $5,000. Greater. More than that. More than $8,000. $8,499. This was probably a $1,000 or $2,000 computer at the time, although it had lightning-fast 320 megahertz processor and monitor and mouse not included. So you're paying $8,500 for a computer that doesn't even have a monitor or mouse, and it's probably worth an eighth of that. People wonder why Radio Shack went out of business or isn't doing very well. Not so funny? See, I think this is really funny. I'm keeping myself entertained even if none of you are. Okay, variables. So we know about identifiers. We're going to start using identifiers to create variables. We've seen variables a lot in math. Y equals mx plus b is the equation for a line in two dimensions that's not vertical. Here, y, m, x, b, they all represent some value. The idea of that equation is to say that it must be the case that that particular equation is true. Well, in a computer program, we're also going to use variables, and we're going to define them this way. Int x equals 5. This is saying a number of things. Here we have int. That's saying that it's going to hold an integer value. Integer values don't have decimal points. 1, 2, 10, 20, those are all integers. Negative 5. 6.2 is not an integer. It's a floating point number or a real number. X is our identifier. We could have put anything that we want in there. We've chosen to give it name X. And then we set it equal to value 5. What this does is this creates some spot in memory. It calls it X, and it gives it value 5. Somewhere in the computer's memory, who knows where, really who cares where at this point in the course, somewhere in the computer's memory there is a spot that now has value 5. Whenever we want to refer to that spot, we just call it X. So this is why we use identifiers. We don't have to pay attention to where in memory it is or how it's stored there. We just say X equals 5, and poof, we know 5 is stored there. And, of course, the semicolon, excuse me, a semicolon to end the statement. And that's the visualization. It's some spot in memory. The label or the identifier we use is X, and the value stored in there is 5. Right, right, right. In particular, as we're going to see in a second, the variable is X and the type is int. That last sentence I just said might not make sense for a couple slides, but by either the end of today's lecture or Wednesday's lecture, it'll make a lot more sense. So an integer variable, not surprisingly, can only hold integers. So it can't hold 4.3. If we want to do a floating point number, floating point means a decimal point can move back and forth, or in other words, a real number, we use a type called double. Why it's called double, we'll see in a couple minutes. So double D equals 4.3. There we've created a variable. It's called D. It now has value 4.3. And that's stored somewhere else in memory. Who knows where? Who cares where? Variable C, type is double. So the equals operator, or the equals sign, is an assignment operator. This often is a bit confusing. Equals in math is showing you that one side has the same value as the other side. In Java, that's not what it's saying. What it's saying is it's going to take the value on the right and copy it into what's ever on the left. So when I say int x equals 5,
Sure, if x equals 5, semicolon. If I say x equals 5, this is really saying x gets 5, or x gets the value of 5. Because we're taking 5, or what's ever on the right, and copying it into what's ever on the left. This is not an equality operator like you're used to in math. Um, this is just saying that I'm going to assign 2x the value of 5. I, I'm stressing that a lot because it's, it's a, a very common mistake that people make uh, initially. So target is wherever the value is going. Expression is whatever the value is. And it's basically taking expression and copying it into target. Int j equals 11 and j equals 1985. Here I copied 11 into j. Here I copied 1985 into j. And you'll notice that the keyword int is only on the first one. What happens in Java is that the first line declares a variable j. It's an int variable. I'm going to hold value 11. Now that variable has already been declared in memory. Somewhere in memory is a spot called j. You cannot declare it again, because Java doesn't like that. Once you create a variable, and the fact that you say int j is creating it, you can then give it another value just by saying j equals 1985. So the fact that the int is to the left of the j means that you're creating it. Um, and you can only create it once, and then here you're just giving it a different value. Yes? Why do you have to type an integer and you change it midway double? Uh, good question. The, the question was, if you have um, a type of integer, can you change it later to double? Uh, no, you can't. Once you create a variable of a given type, it's going to have that type for the rest of its very short electronic life. <coughs> j is 11, and then we say j equals 1985, and poof, j becomes 1985. Okay. So let's look at this. Int a equals 1, and int a squared equals a times a. The first line, int a equals 1, is going to create the top of those two. A spot in memory called a has value 1. Int a squared equals a times a. When looking on the right and Java wants to evaluate a times a, it knows a refers to that spot in memory, so it's going to read whatever value is there in memory. It's going to read 1, multiply by 1 by 1, get 1, store 1 in a squared, right? In case you forgot that 1 squared was 1. Int a equals 5, I'm sorry, <clears throat> a equals 5. So here I'm going to assign the value in a to 5. And proof, the value in spot A in memory has now changed. Notice that the only thing that changed at this point in the code was A. I then say A squared equals A times A, so that this is going to become 25. Int I equals 0, I equals I plus 1. First line creates I, an integer in memory, gives it value 0. I equals I plus 1. First, it looks at the right side. We know i has value 0, right? We add 1 to it. We're going to store 1 then in i itself. So i then becomes 1. <coughs> Int as a rating. Notice here, I just said int as a rating, and I haven't given it a value. Here we are declaring a variable, meaning we're creating it in memory, but we're not giving it a value. And Java's fine with this, but you'll notice that at this point in the code, as a rating does not have a value. It is called undefined, or I'm sorry, it's called uninitialized. We're going to see a, a bit about uh, uninitialized variables later on, but at this point in the code, meaning when it's just executed that first line, as a rating is uninitialized. The next line, you see, as a rating oops, equals 400, we've now given it a value. <coughs> So the two parts here, we have variable um, declaration, meaning we are declaring the variable or we're creating it in memory. And we have variable initialization, meaning we're initializing it or giving some initial value. In this last example, that was on two separate lines. This, the declaration or creating the variable, is on the same line as the initialization or giving it a value. It can be separated. It doesn't have to be.
Here's a snippet of code that uses doubles. Double x equals 5.12. Double y equals 19.28. <clears throat> what this code is going to do is it's going to swap the values in x and y. So right now, x is the lesser of the two. When it's done, y is going to be the lesser of the two. So double, remember x equals x. So we're storing the current value of x in remember x. So it looks at the right side. That's 5.12. It stores that in remember x. You say x equals y. So we're going to copy, oops, we're going to copy y into x, or say x guess y. So whatever is currently in y, which is 19.28, is going to be copied into x. Now both have 19.28. And then y equals remember x, that value is copied into there. If you turn the y, if I add the word to look, would it? So why is structure? If you did it here, if you change y to x here. You change it. Right, so the question was, if you have this instead as y equals x, yeah. no, that would work very differently. Semicolon. So, we can create variables, we can assign them values. There are times we want to print them out to the screen so that the user who's running the program sees what the variables are. And in order to do that, so int x equals 5, I have declared it and initialized it. I print it out this way. The value of x is an x. Notice that I have in double quotes some string that I want to print out. I then have a plus sign and then my variable. When you're dealing with printing out stuff to the screen, Java knows that the plus sign doesn't mean try to add, you know, to do addition of it, but to take those and print them out to the screen together. Java knows to do that. So this is saying I'm going to print out the value of x is and whatever the value of x is. Right. So we enclose all strings in double quotes. That's how Java knows where the string starts and then when the string ends. <clears throat> um, right, if there are multiple parts to be printed, separate them by a plus sign. <coughs> right, separate them by a plus sign. Okay. So this is from the lab that you're going to see this upcoming week. Uh, in particular, you're going to deal a lot with um, uh, creating variables, manipulating them, and other such stuff. And I'm not going to, <coughs> I'm going to sort of breeze past this because there's only a couple things I really want to show you here. Um, and yes, there should be a lot more comments. I don't care. <laughs> so I've told you all about how comments are really good. You're not going to see many comments in my slides. So this is one of those things is do as I say, not as I do. The reason is, is that I've limited sort of real estate to display all this code on the slides. So I can't, if I had comments here, the stuff would be really tiny and you wouldn't be able to read it. So here we're declaring a number of integer variables. A, B, C, D, all giving them values. Here we're declaring a number of double variables. In particular, you'll notice that we are doing arithmetic operations on them. So C plus 2 times A. Well, it's going to do 2 times A first. A is 3. 2 times 3 is 6. And then you can add that to C. 6 plus 6 is 12. So result 2 is going to hold value 12. <coughs> but it's a double. So it actually holds 12.0. We'll get to that later. And then here, you'll notice that most of these lines are going to print out Result 5, so here we have the string, the plus sign, and then the variable we want to print out. <clears throat> Couple other things to note. Oh, wait, change color. These lines here just print out a blank line so that the output will skip a line. So if you just call system.out.println and you have an empty parentheses, it just prints out a blank line. Not needed, it just, you know, sometimes makes the output a bit easier to read. All the details about how this works, I'm kind of skipping over. Uh, some of that we'll see later, and they'll be reinforced in the lab. Yes? So if you want blank space, you have to put that system out print line, and you put 
But if you were to put white space in there... Correct. Correct. The question was, if you want a blank, let me rephrase that to say a blank line, you would have to put system.out.print line. If you just have a couple of things of white space, that's not going to show out onto the screen. It turns out that there are other ways to print blank lines to the screen. We're going to see that, I think, this week or next week. But for now, this will certainly do blank lines. Right. Right. Notice that there's a lot of semicolons. In fact, one after each statement, as it turns out. So... Give me two seconds. So variable initialization. I mentioned this briefly before. Index, that declares x as a variable. It creates a spot in memory, but does not give it a value. Why? Because there is no value to give it. Java doesn't know what value to give it. Then I say x equals 5. That's giving that spot in memory the value number 5. It's pretty much the same thing as just doing it on the same line. There's slight differences, but I'm going to ignore those. Do whatever is easier. Personally, I find it easier to do this, because then you don't forget to give it a value. If you forget to give it a value, as we'll see later on, it causes lots of problems. So you can use variables as much as you want. You only can create them once. Because once they're created, or once they're declared, then you don't need to declare them a second time. So this code will not work. Because you're creating a spot in memory called x, giving it value 5, and then you're trying to create a second spot in memory called x, and give it value 6. But there already is an x spot in memory. So you can only declare variables once. Right. Can't declare. You could say int y equals 6 for the second line. That would be fine, because then you'd have an x variable and a y variable. You can't have multiple variables of the same name. Yes. The question is, after it's declared, you can change it as much as you like. But it can only be created once. Once it's created, you can assign it any values. You can assign it values as much as you'd like. OK. Of course, I need to go through a couple of the motivators. Blame. The secret to success is knowing who to blame for your failures. Not so funny? Loneliness. If you find yourself struggling with loneliness, you're not alone. And yet you are alone. So very alone. You can tell that that was photoshopped. Problems. No matter how great and destructive your problems may seem now, remember, you've probably only seen the tip of them. Discovery. A company that will go to the ends of the earth for its people will find it can hire them for about 10% of the cost of Americans. I'll see you all on Wednesday. <laughs>